Welcome back to the Help Me Rhonda Show. This week, I've got a very special guest. Now, as you know, I always bring on sexy brands, like those that are making a major difference in the world, not only with their gifts, but with their ideas and their experiences. So if you are an artist or a creative or someone that has been pushed up against the grind, but leans into their belief system and what they truly are, then you're gonna love this show. Because my guest today is Johnny Cota. He's actually a fashion designer, but he's also season one winner of Making the Cut, which is a fashion competition hosted by Amazon. Now, if you have seen that, make sure you're making some noise because Johnny did something really special. He actually won a million dollars on this show. So we're gonna learn more about what happened, why he came onto this show, and what's happening next for the Johnny Cota brand. So. Johnny, welcome Hi. to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, really, really awesome. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're here in Bali, which is rather unique, because you're not from Bali. Well, I'm from LA, but I've been in Bali for years and years make, doing my brand here and manufacturing here. And the quality of life, I mean, as you know, yeah. it can't be beat. No, you know, so. man, it's so true. So you've actually, you're, you've been manufacturing your Johnny Cota brand before in Bali already. Totally, for okay. about maybe 12, 13 years, 14 years. I had a brand called Skin Graft, and we were out okay. here always making leather goods, leather accessories, leather jackets. Good place for Going it. back and forth between LA and here. Yeah. Um, learning a lot, making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. But ultimately, really um, thriving here yeah. in Bali. And yeah. so I'm lucky to still be here. Well, it's a good spot to be. But before we really go deeply into you as a fashion designer, what took mm -hmm. place on the show, like, when did you start becoming, where did this inspiration come from? Like, is your family artists? Are they fashion designers? Like, what is that, where did this come from? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was raised with, in a really religious family in like the suburbs up near San Francisco. And um, no one was really creative in my family. But, you know, at a young age, I realized I was gay. And that is kind of sets you on a different path where yeah. you know your life isn't gonna look like everyone else's. Mm. I think it's almost a blessing because there's, no, ex there's a different expectation of you. Yeah. You know, you know I think yeah. that even a lot of parents don't really necessarily know how to guide their gay children. Yeah. And so they always end up in the arts or doing really creative things or maybe fantastic things. Yeah. Well, all right, let me, I'm going to be, I'm going to use the devil's advocate here and say yeah. what people might be thinking. That sounds really stereotypical, right? Here, I'm from San Francisco. I'm a, you know, I'm a gay man. Uh -huh. You know, I have a religious family. Uh -huh. Like, so, and, and I'm not saying that as a joke, but that's like, wow, well, that's like pretty, like the perfect picture. Yeah. What happened for you? Like, where's your parents, especially when you're in a religious family, was that a challenge for you? Were they supportive? Like, how did that thrive? Because it helps us really understand why and what you're doing today and how, what drove you to do mm -hmm. it. Hmm, I don't know if I've put it into words, but let me try. Right yeah, now. Okay. okay, so yeah. Super religious family, yeah. always loving, but when you realize you're so different, and you, you go to church every Sunday and you know you don't fit in. Right. It kind of drove me to this really kind of dark place okay. with music, with fashion, with style. But it's also where you've, I first started expressing myself. You know, okay. I first started wearing like all black or maybe I put studs in my backpack or I started going to How raves. How old were you at this time? 13, probably okay. 13 years right. old. So going team. to raves, going to punk shows, like kind of trying to find yeah. yourself in alternative settings yeah. and like um, kind of fringe communities. And so it actually turned into a blessing where you kind of discover a more alternative, more like a less expected version of yourself. So I, I would say, if I trace back my design aesthetic and my, mm -hmm. my, um, my desire to create, I bring it back to being a 13 year old goth kid living wow. in, in a religious house, trying to create an identity. Yeah. And my parents, are the most supporting, loving parents ever. And they but were I, at that time too? Yeah, but I didn't know. Uh -huh, you know, yeah, sometimes yeah. you just don't know. Like even if you're yeah. getting the love and support, that they're giving it all to you. Sometimes yeah. you just don't get well, because it. Because you're so different. I mean, you are different. You're seeing society, maybe not society is accepting it. So you're thinking your parents may not either. Yeah. Is that kind of an internal? Yeah, I think I yeah. projected onto them. Yeah. I projected onto them yeah. that they weren't kind of supporting, but they yeah. always were. I look back and I'm like, wow, I was such an idiot teenager <sighs> because it was there and it was precious and it was warm and I wasn't feeling it. But I mean, you know, it's like I'm married. I've been married for, I've been with my partner for 12 years. They, they I think they might be closer to my husband than they are to me. You know, they call him every day. And so it's like, they are super supportive. Oh, that's I'm very really, well, that's beautiful because that's, you know, that's 
maybe not always everyone's story. Yeah, definitely. But you did bring up something really cool, and I think that it's important to highlight that, is that maybe there are some uh, teens or going to their 20s that maybe going through exactly what you were, which is like I'm you know, identifying as something different than what society says I need to be, mm -hmm. and that maybe their families are supportive. And I think it's you know having a 13-year-old daughter you know, I'm always aware of that, like, what is she gonna think of me, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And But it's not up to me to control that, it's up to her to really see it, and how can we showcase that? But it's nice to know that maybe there are others that families are could be more supportive than they even realize at totally, this time. Yeah. I think sometimes when we try to create our own path, we feel like we have to push, push away. away. Yeah. Um, and that's a lesson that you learn as you get older. Yeah, you know? for sure. So. All right, let's talk about this um, inspiration of you becoming a fashion designer. Like, where did that actually come from? Okay, so I was in university. I graduated, I got a call one day that's like, oh, you graduated. I was like, wait, I still have like another half year. <laughs> it was totally out of the blue. And I was like, okay, 10 minutes later, I get a call from my DJ friend and he's like, we're going on a tour with a circus for all summer. Wait a circus. Do you want to come? And I was like. <laughs> like Barnum and Bailey style? No, it was like, <laughs> it was very like costume based, like adult circus. So it was okay, like. Okay, like a Cirque du Soleil. Like yeah. early age of Cirque du Soleil. Totally, yeah. Sexy, funky. Okay, Sexy. now I'm thinking no. clowns and no. elephants. <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, wait a minute. You were a fashion designer? <laughs> no. Inspiration came from the circus. No, it was, it was vaudeville. It was okay. chic. It was sexy. Super sexy Dangerous. And chic. Fire. Uh, still, uh, you know, kind of yeah. a lot of skin. Yeah. Yeah, makeup right. and also yeah. while I was so I said yeah I'll come I have nothing to lose like let's let's do this so I jumped on the tour bus all summer I learned how to stilt walk in the parking lot of a grocery <laughs> store like while we were getting gas and groceries they're like if you're on this bus you better do something because there's only room for performers and you're just like the plus one so get ready because your first show is wow. in like three days taught me how to stilt walk made me costumes and kind of just threw me out there and it was the best experience of my life and on that tour um, I was surrounded by all these beautiful costumes, all these eccentric people, yeah. and we would make the costumes on the tour bus. And someone said one day, you know, no one's gonna make your next costume for you. You better do it yourself. There's a sewing machine right there. And so they taught me how to sew, and that's how I learned. So everything I know now in fashion, I learned in the circus. Okay, that's a big statement. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I love that. I didn't realize that. So it's like, a, yeah, I mean, I can so see the glam and the and just the, ex, you know, accentuating the body and, but the fact that you learned it from the circus people is 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 pretty special. You know, what's funny like, is when you're in it, you, sometimes you don't You didn't even... go to school for fashion design. Oh, no, definitely not. Wait, you just won a million dollars on making the cut, <laughs> and you learned everything from the circus. Yeah, I know, right? What a lesson in life. <laughs> okay, that's pretty crazy. All right, so you'd already... You, you've had your, your label now and your brand for over 15 years, but the Making the Cut show was just a year ago. Yep. So what got you to making the decision to actually joining the show? Okay. Right? Because you take this circus, you build this brand, you had already been successful, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, what had been happening until you said, I'm going to go on a show? Like, so with my first, my brand skin graph, we did a lot of, since it's coming from circus, I did a lot of stage wear. So we did stuff okay. for Gaga, Janet Jackson, Rihanna, wow. you know, Justin Bieber. I mean, pretty much all the pop stars. And how did Brittany. you enter that? From circus to entering into celebrity? Like, there's so many things. Man. I know. Well, you know. I keep like having to pull it. Well, that was the fortune thing of being based in LA you're just surrounded uh, by that yeah, the industry okay. is around there. if right. you're making cool stuff and yeah. back then our only means to um, communicate with people was MySpace so we were brand on MySpace and I remember like Marilyn Manson's manager or, or no was it Pink's manager was like oh can you make a jacket and it's like oh my god this huge opportunity oh. we'd get opportunities like that Right. And also, we would be still walking. And you're um, walking around. It's eccentric. You just meet people. We were doing Coachella, yeah. like before Coachella was cool. And then, like, you meet all the artists back when it was okay. small. All right. So it was uh, one thing just led to the other. And the brand had its ups and downs. You know, we did New York Fashion Week for many, many seasons. Eventually, we sold the brand. It got super commercial for a year. We bought, we, we freaked out. We bought it back. Ups and downs. So many wow. peaks and so many valleys. Wow. And at the beginning of, I, mean, I think, 2019, we were, we were kind of going down. We were going down, money was tight, uh -huh. funding was tight. The brand felt like it was coming to the end of a chapter. Mm. And I don't know if there was a new chapter after that. Uh -huh. And someone reached out to me and said, hey, I have an opportunity for you. There's a new show coming out on Amazon and it's a competition about creative directors. So it's like uh, most of these other ones are like sewing competitions for right. designers. We want someone who can do branding, who can create a lifestyle, who can also who can do runway shows. It's not just sewing. And I was like, you know what? All these sewing shows, I could never 
even make it past the first challenge, I'm sure. But what you're saying right now, if it's talking about branding and building a brand, that's what I do. And this sounds awesome. Cool. And so I did the audition video and I got called in for a few castings. And one day I was in Bali and I got a phone call. They're like, you're on the show. In 30 days, you are flying to New York. And that's all we're going to tell you. And I was like, ah! No way. <laughs> yeah. How exciting. Super exciting. All right. Yeah. So, but how scary is, well, at the same time. Like, what, were you really super confronted with that? Absolutely terrified. Yeah. <laughs> terrified. Yeah. So you went, so you had already made it. So you sent in your video, but you made it. So you're like on the show. On the show. And you fly there. What happens when you fly to New York? Well, I remember I, I packed, I didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. Was it all going to be filmed in New York? Were we traveling the world? They didn't tell us the, even the name of the show. Like there was so much secrecy, which mm. I respect now, but at the time I didn't get it. Yeah. And I, I was packed and I was in the airport and my mom called like, wish me luck. And I just lost it. I just sobbed like like someone had died like just just sobbing. She's like what is wrong? And I'm realizing I'm about to put myself out there in a way that I haven't before. And you're kind of feeling down because you're kind of in a Totally. Am I going to embarrass point. myself? Am I going to ruin my brand? Am yeah. I going to ruin my reputation? Yeah. Or am I going to soar? You know and like throwing yourself into the unknown, right? Like really confronting fear. Yeah. And I sobbed for half that flight to New York and then I landed and I was like, "Coda, pull it together." And then you know arrived and started filming, and it was challenging. Every single day was challenging, but it really pushed me past my limits. It made me a better designer and a better person, and I'm super grateful for it. Wow, that's I, I love that. I remember um, a, a a moment in time where Naomi Campbell like ripped you to shreds. Yeah. And it, it was, you know, it, it felt heavy. It was like maybe a minute to two minutes, what we get to see. But like, share that. What happened with that? Like, what, how did that help change you? <laughs> the second episode of Making the Cut, Naomi Campbell's one of the judges, and she's kind of the most outspoken and iconic, definitely, yeah. For, yeah, sure. for sure. And she just fed me to the wolves. Just like, <laughs> just her critiques were so intense. Damaging. Yeah, she just like, she took it. And once I, when I almost couldn't handle any more, she just kind of came in for the kill. And everything was just saying, you know, you're not giving us enough. We're not seeing a future in you. We're not seeing, you're not wowing us. And instead you're boring us. And I'm just like sitting there on camera, like, just, just, Sweating. Just and this is which devastated. episode? The second episode. Oh, Jesus. So, so you're almost like hacked. Oh, uh, yeah. I just got there. I, I mean, you know, I haven't even gotten to show them what I do. And I was devastated. And after I, she, she lectured me forever, what we saw was maybe a minute, but it lasted 20 minutes, you know? Wow. Like even the judges were like, damn, you can see, like, I'm not, totally, like, chill out. And um, it's not about how you fall, I think it's about how you get back up. And I think that that was the pivotal moment for me. It changed my entire competition. Because I said to her, I know I have the talent. I know I have the entrepreneurial spirit. I know I'm what you're looking for, and I'm going to prove it. Give me this opportunity. Keep me here. Don't send me home today. And I promise you, I will impress you. And I spoke with such conviction. She was like, OK. And each judge was like, do we keep him? Keep them. And I'll tell you what. It so you were fighting for your life at oh, that yeah. point. Fighting for my life wow. to stay there. And every, and then I'll tell you what, the next episode just started, boom, succeeding, thriving, just like killing it, killing it, killing it. And I turned into a really phenomenal season where I was always a front runner. And nobody expected that at the beginning. At being grilled by Naomi Campbell, every, even designer, every yeah. designer was like, this guy's gone. We give him a week. You know, it's like everyone, no one believed in me. And sometimes that pushes you that much yeah. like harder to like believe in yourself. It really, I think it's, it really, without that, I don't know if I would have won. It was that challenge and yeah. overcoming it that brought yeah. me to Yeah. Well, I mean, you already talked about that at 13. You were already find, trying to find your way yeah. through stuff that wasn't normal, okay, yeah. right? Naturals, that seems like it's kind of part of your mojo. Oh, whenever someone says you can't do something, you're like, well, yeah, probably I, know. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm from Detroit, so like, <laughs> okay. I am like a survivor. <laughs> right? um, okay, so this is pretty cool. So, so she rips you apart, you get to stay. Mm. Well, did you get any preparation being the show? Like, I've, I've loved watching these shows. My daughter, Hannah Lay, she's a fashion designer. Mm -hmm. Like we watched Project Runway with Heidi Klum. We loved, you know, the, all, everything that they did. And now we get to watch this show, but we don't really know what's the background. Like what, how is the show like? I mean, is it enjoyable or is it like, oh, you're under a, a pressure cooker? 
Oh. And how much time do you really get? Feels like you just had an overnight, you made a whole collection. <laughs> like, did you get a week? Like, what is it? It's fast. I mean, every episode is filmed maybe in two days. It's like you get the challenge, you run and buy fabric, you start sewing. One thing that I think a lot of people believe about these kind of shows is that they're all kind of set up. Like, it's uh -huh, all set yeah, up. Right. Not an ounce of it is set up. It's wow. very genuine. You learn about the rules of the episode when everyone else does. They send you, the, I mean, it, it, nothing was crafted. It was all super genuine. That's all the freaking know. out, every time I cried, every time like the pressure became too much was real. You know, it's like no one's turning it on. Yeah. Like it really was a very genuine experience. And maybe you get two days per challenge. And I hadn't sewn for 10 years. And they were like, okay, now what? you have to Right, because you had manufacturing. Yeah, I don't sew. I mean, I did at the beginning of my brand, but now oh I don't. Oh my goodness, right. And I was under the impression we wouldn't have to sew. And they're like, oh, now you have to sew and sew and sew and sew. Like, it was a headache. But I will say, I cried myself to sleep every night. And every morning, I looked in the mirror and I said, coat up, pull it together. And then you just go on set and do it. Wow, I'm like kind of amazed that you hadn't sewn in 10 years and you actually made the most epic collections. I was, you know what I was doing is when we were on our flights, because we ended up traveling the world, people would sleep and people would watch movies. I watched YouTubes of how to sew a puff sleeve, how okay. to do pleats on the waist. Because I hadn't sewn for so long, so I would watch, you the whole time I was watching like YouTubes and like how to set a collar, how to like do buttonholes, and it's just something that's not in my skill set. Yeah. And, um, and I was studying the entire time. And wow. I just like, oh, I learned how to do a puff sleeve, and then the next episode I do a puff sleeve, and they would be like, that's beautiful. I'm thinking, <laughs> the I just learned. learned. <laughs> yeah, totally. Wow, that's actually that's like very inspirational even to think. I mean, that's obviously the style of person that you are, and it brings into, you know, how many people would just easily give up or watch movies and rely on what they have, mm -hmm. right? And then you obviously continue to make it. Um, I. Um, I remember that I think it was the yeah it was the final episode because that's when mm. you won. Mm -hmm. You were against this one woman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Esther. She's Esther. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and and how are you feeling at that moment? Like here you are, you've made it. Um, actually, before I talk about that, there was something you had said to me earlier that I want to highlight, which I think is really amazing on the model that Amazon put together. That you would make a collection, and if you won, tell us about what happened. They would sell your collection. So. It was a super unique show yeah. that every episode, if you win, they would take the piece and they'd produce it. And as soon as the episode comes out, people could buy it right away, which I think is a really awesome way to change how we shop, right? Yeah. See it now, buy it now. It's like retail is dying. Like, how do we reinvent shopping? So I was pretty, ins really inspired by that. And then, well, one of the like awards, you know, you win a million dollars, but you also get a chance to do a collection with Amazon. So we were both competing for that. Ah, we were kind of, right. Yeah, definitely for the money, but also for like a worldwide, you know, collection that gets so much exposure to all these people. Yeah. And for just the whole entire world has access to it. Yeah. So that, I remember telling it in the second to last episode, we have to do a pitch to the president of Amazon Fashion, a business pitch. And it's like in a skyscraper in Manhattan, everyone's all dressed up and you have to pitch. And I'm like sweating out of places I didn't even know I had, you know? And I, and I remember saying, I don't care about the million dollars. I can turn a mentorship with Amazon and a collection with your network into something more profitable than a million dollars. I don't care about the money. I want the chance. And she was like, okay. <laughs> And I do believe that. I believe yeah. it strongly. Yeah. Yeah. So you. So here's you and Esther standing there, and you are literally on the line. Yeah. Well, how did that moment feel? It's like dum. <sighs> like. I mean, I don't think I've ever been so like, excited did you and expect terrified. It though? <sighs> when I packed to go there, I packed for two weeks. I was like, I'll get to maybe episode two. <gasps> so to get. So I didn't expect it ever, but. Along the way, I gained more and more confidence yeah, yeah. and more self-value. And I, you know, um, my final collection, I actually flew to Bali, did the collection, then flew to New York and did the whole runway show with this collection that I just spent 30 days making. And I was so proud of it. At that point, even though I was terrified, I didn't care if I won. Yeah. I knew I'd yeah. shown my best version of myself and that was kind of what mattered. But then when they said my name, so you found out in that moment, like that was oh, real. Yeah, it you know, was real. Literally standing there, because like you know they do some of the, the what well, the pageants, and yeah. they, they or like RuPaul will do, mm -hmm. and he'll film all of them, and the, the one just wins. But yeah. that was her expression among everyone. But you really stood there, and you really won. You it. really stood there and really discovered. And what I'd heard is that from like people on set is that nobody knew. 
Like, it, the judges were actually speaking for the very first time wow, who they thought cool. she So I don't even think the producers or the people behind the camera knew even who knew. was going to win, you know? So it, and it got down to, I think it's five judges and two votes for her and then two votes for me. And we're holding hands. We're like, oh my God, one of our lives, well, both of our lives are going to change, but one of us is about to get this huge honor. And when they said, who I was think that? Who Nicole Richie was like, I think Johnny should win. And I just laughed. Oh, you just gave it <laughs> I know, I just... Lost it, totally lost it. Wow, so what happened from there? So you win, then like, all of a sudden you're like instant famous. Like you're already famous because you're in the show. Like, but this is like, you won. It's transformed my brand. Completely transformed. Totally. What's happened for the Johnny Cota brand? Well, I mean, the Johnny. we watched Johnny Cota Studio, which is a collection that we did with Amazon. Uh -huh. And then I'm also doing Johnny Cota, my namesake brand. Launched two collections since the show. Introduced my first perfume, just did my second perfume last week, which has been always a dream of mine. Lifestyle products, candles, kind yeah. of just all the categories I've always wanted to do, but never had the resources. So that's really what the that's biggest thing big that's come from one. this is yeah. resources and funds. Yeah. And we, um, so right now we are doing all that, telling our brand story, building a new factory here in Bali, kind of a new studio, a new atelier where you know we're gonna have like the students in the fashion schools come through and kind of like give them like little tutorials about like here's what we do here and here's what how we're trying to make a difference with fashion and you know the best thing about winning this money is we've wanted to do so we've wanted to put so much t energy into like sustainable efforts mm -hmm. and, and kind of really Creating the brand we've always envisioned, yeah. but it's expensive to do that. Mm -hmm. It is expensive. If it was cheap, you got to test it. You got to figure things out, and that's yeah. cost money. If it's cheap, everyone would do it. Yeah, Why wouldn't right. you be sustainable? Yeah. Yeah. So it's helping us create the brand we always envisioned, and I feel mm -hmm. super lucky for that. Wow, that's amazing, and I love that you're doing it here in Bali because that also gives you even a more leg up with your brand because you're actually giving back. Yeah. Right. I mean, we live in Bali. My daughter's a fashion designer here. It's like we had a hundred employees that mm. were changing their lives. So mm -hmm. I think I think more than more than ever now, people are really looking for connection. Yeah. And if we're gonna buy a brand, if we're gonna actually invest our time and our money now, because our, everyone's money is very unstable and very mm. precious, even more so than it ever was, that I'd rather buy a brand that's actually has a lot of heartbeat to it, mm -hmm. right? And it gives back. Yeah. And so tell us about this new factory. What's happening here? So, I mean, we've, we've had big factories, small ones. And for the last few years, I have this little tiny office. It's, it's really um, underwhelming. And so with, with you know, winning the show and yeah. having these new funds, we're kind of renovating this big, beautiful atelier, um, kind of in the you know, Seminyak area, out, like, surrounded by rice fields, all painted black. Oh it's like the goodness. ultimate vision. Yes. And the, what I learned on the show you know, sometimes you're doing something really unique and you don't realize it until people point it out. Yeah. I didn't realize it was a unique that I did the circus. I definitely didn't realize it was unique to pretty producing in Bali. I was like, I love it there, you know? Yeah. So we have learned since the win, since the brand has blown up, everyone responds to the story, like you're saying. Here's who sews the clothes. Yes. Here's what their families look like. Here's what our workshop looks like. And now with this new space, we'll get even greater opportunity to show our entire story our entire process and make people feel even more excited about supporting the brand yeah and so for me this has been the missing piece create a home a home base that we can call our own that everyone who follows the brand can get really excited about and see it flourish and see us do what we do because yeah. you know not to be i'm not jaded but i've been doing this for a long time you know yeah. almost 15 years yeah. the fashion industry is ruthless and i don't really have a desire to get back into it mm. like we were doing it before yeah. it has to be done differently otherwise i'm out and so now we get an opportunity to kind of create our own path and do our own way well i really love that and i mean it gives it gives so much more uh depth to choices that we're making mm -hmm. right i mean sustainability, saving the planet, like it has real, it's real now. It used yeah. to have this cliche and we're doing this. However, I do believe that more and more people are really making conscious choices mm -hmm. and we're selecting with conscious brands. They're doing good things and it just so happens to be fashionable, right? Great and combination, I, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, when Hannah Lay started her brand, it was the same thing. She's like, I just wanna make things that are, are fun and make women feel beautiful and then she saw all this plastic around and she saw this damage and as a young girl at eight years old started her fashion Incredible. label that was sustainable yeah. but we could have never done it in the United States mm -hmm. we're here in Bali yeah right we could have not done it and so I think that 
that now that storyline that you're telling is just mm -hmm. so powerful and and to to hear where you came from that mm -hmm. it literally came from the circuits like you ever reach out to these people <laughs> and go wow <laughs> are people reaching out to you after you win oh like, the circuit uh, friends are like oh my god did you just win did, was there a picture of you on stilts on the amazon show right like, yeah but you know similar to like your daughter's story about you know starting her brand at eight um eight years old so yeah. that's incredible for me also it's like whenever young designers ask me for advice um i guess you don't have to be young it could be any designer yeah. that's starting their journey i always say just do it yeah. just start yeah. you don't need the degree you don't need the piece of paper you don't need so many people get caught up with like i don't have the training i don't have the authority i don't have yeah. the, just start. i don't know how to sew I who mean, cares you were on freaking national tv and did not sew. i anymore. know right <laughs> watch <laughs> youtube figure it out your daughter yeah. was eight like yeah. just just have a passion yeah. have a vision and yeah. just start and you know what you will learn from your mistakes yeah and you will learn you will learn you will craft your vision you'll craft your um uh, creative identity by all of your failures. They, your failures will like pave the road to your success. Yeah, I love that. Um, and w so then what is really next for John Akota's brand? I mean, you're building the, the manufacturing house, but like what's next? Like, are, is there collections that are, we should be waiting for and ready for? So we, well, it's a funny time in the world, as we all know, right? Clearly. So we launched my <laughs> namesake store, my, the Johnny Akota retail concept store in LA in the middle of a pandemic you know so we're like okay yeah so we're like okay so the the concept is it's a pandemic so everyone like you know wears their masks yeah. you scan the qr codes it tells you about the item and mm -hmm. it actually has been quite a success yeah so i think that we're just taking it week by week but the vision is to open up some more concept stores mm -hmm. probably open a store here in bali my ultimate vision is really put my roots here mm -hmm. you know i've been coming back and forth for 15 years yeah but I haven't necessarily called it home mm -hmm. or my creative home. Yeah. I think that's what's next. I also nice. think that's what our customers kind of love most. That connects the story. Yeah, that's the unique part of the brand. You know, yeah. it's like anyone can make a leather jacket. Why is this one special? Yeah. Let me show you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love that. Thank you so much. I'm like so honored to be so excited when I told Hannah Lay, she's like, you don't drink anything <laughs> Like when you came for Christmas, we did uh -huh. it, I was like, <laughs> you know, because, you know, it's, it's like, it's so amazing to see someone that's done it, but then to know someone that's like really been working for it, mm -hmm. really working to get to that point. And then, you know, winning a show like this and then just really staking your ground of who you are and, and the impact that you want to leave in the world. It's really inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for Thank being you so here. Much. Wow, what an inspiring story. Like this is the kind of stuff that just makes your heart sing. Like think about someone that, you know, has, you know, even gone through life, through society in a different way, that realized that I wasn't going to, to walk the path that everyone else walks. And I want to pave my own trail and go, go through ups and downs and failures. That's what life's about. That's what living is about. And then to be able to really truly look at yourself in the mirror and say, you got this. Focus, you can do this. That's what we all deserve to hear. And so today's story, I hope this inspired you that you can do it and you can be unstoppable and you can create a sexy brand that leaves an impact on the world and can become a profit-making machine for you. All right, guys, well, we look forward to seeing you next time on the Help Me Rhonda Show. Have an amazing one and don't forget to be unstoppable. We'll see you next time.